You know how, as a responsible adult, you sometimes have to do some truly onerous tasks. Like cleaning yours and close relations' hair out of the shower drain, or pulling the half-decomposed corpse of a corpulent rat out from beneath the porch because it's begun to stink up the place. Well, that is exactly how I feel about having to do this video on Polygon explaining Warhammer 40,000 to me. <laughs> because I know this is going to be trash, you know this is going to be trash. Your normie neighbor's Shetland Terrier knows this is going to be trash. And yet, it's got to be done. Because Polygon are not mere tourists. They are the kind of people who move into your nice franchised neighbourhood, your lovely 41st millennium, and begin shitting up the place on deliberate purpose, only to drive down property prices so they can bring yet further of their mouth-breathing intellectual degenerate idiots into to the community to ruin it completely. Until before you know it, you are living in the detritus heap of a once great franchise, in the ghettoized version of what you once loved. It has happened to so many other franchises, and it is currently happening to 40k. And the only way to have even a snowball's chance in hell of preventing it is to gatekeep, 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 consistently and with perseverance. Which is why I am here with an archived version, of course, of the Polygon article, because you wouldn't want to give the rat cheese, now would you? Warhammer 40k explained. Explained really is the worst word in anything. It's like, I am going to explain this to you. Well, do you know it yourself? No, but I'm, I'm pretty good at pretending, I suppose. That's right, we explain all 40,000 Warhammers. Just leave. Just sit here for a while. I am pretty sure my Dad made this joke once when I brought home my very first 40k book at some point. Why are there so many of them? Like, ah. Okay, let's not get stuck on the very first hurdle, shall we? What I'm a 40k is a tabletop war game played with miniatures. I'm surprised he got that part right. The first launched in the 1980s, 1987 to be precise, but I wouldn't expect you to be able to Google that. Alongside rule books packed with additional fluff and lore, decades later, that fluff has sprawled out into its own massive narrative universe, and the lore has been adopted into novels, audio dramas, movies, tragically, and animations and video games. Now, you could have also mentioned that it wasn't actually its own entity, that it was actually spawned from a different board game that was actually an attempt to move the far more than successfully fantasy setting over into a science fiction setting, that being Warhammer, of course, with 40k being originally intended to be a well, sort of specialized spin-off of that, but then turned out to be very popular. But again, I wouldn't expect you to be able to Google the Wikipedia article for Warhammer 40,000. The media property is currently in pre-production as a TV and cinematic universe led by Superman and the Witcher star Henry Cavill. Meanwhile, the war game is about to enter its 10th edition, which aims to be more accessible and pared down than previous editions. Oh, good. People keep asking me how I feel about the 10th edition, and I'm just like, okay. Here's the thing. If you could take the currently a little bit bloated, but still far more pared down the previous edition rule sets, and make it a bit more straightforward to play, I would hardly be an opponent of that. But I don't trust current year Games Workshop's ability to do so, and we've already sacrificed the overwhelming majority of complexity that once existed in 40k in order to have bigger and more expensive models, which are being created solely because they're more profitable. Fun fact, incidentally. And also, there has been a little bit of movement on the Henry Cavill thing. At the very least, Amazon has begun to set up internal emails, I've been told by my Amazon intern, that they are beginning to then um, interact with Games Workshop directly and they're having their own contact. So, some movement, but it is still beyond pre-production. You've likely seen images from the brand or announcements about a new game or adaptation of the universe. If you're curious about this huge franchise, you probably want to know what is the world of Warhammer 40k about? Let us dive in. What even is, ah, oh, Warhammer 40k? 
there has been little active curation of Warhammer 40k canon. Well, no, actually there has been a great deal of active curation of Warhammer 40k canon. In fact, you're not allowed to publish any 40k canon unless James, Work James Workshop Games Workshop has approved it. Now, to be fair, they do a piss poor job of it, but no, there, there, there has been a fair bit of curation. Instead, Games Workshop and its publishing arm, Black Library, has taken the stance that everything ever written about it is sprawling lore is true. No, no, they have not. They have taken the stance that the it, it is the oh my Jesus, we've got to start all the way at the beginning, don't we? Games Workshop official stance is that they have the unreliable narrator, which is why one Black Library book can contradict another, and GW has electors simply go, unreliable narrator, it could all be propaganda, you know, everything is true and nothing is true. It's a cheap cop-out. The Warhammer 40k universe is still, to its credit, and getting less and less so, one of the more internally consistent universe, and it is because GW does curate everything that goes on in it. This is why, for example, when they make a video game, they've got to license out particular portions of the universe, and they have to receive checks and balances and okays from GW for everything they do. All of it is a canon, more or less, since its inception in the 1980s, just like actual history, no single narrator or historian in the Grim Dark of the Far Future is 100% reliable. Again, it's a cop-out. Instead, it is up to the reader to sift through all the dusty and highly collectible tomes in order to pass its primary sources. Much like real history, it can be hard to piece everything together. Fan wikis and forums can be esoteric and packed with proper nouns. Meanwhile, since the narrative has never been rebooted or retconned, well, actually it sort of has since first edition Rogue Trader isn't proper 40k, but if I get stuck to carve on every single part, I'll be here forever. There are few official on-ramps for new players, but it's possible to engage with the 40k fandom with a running start. Gather up bits of its nearly 40k, 40 year backstory as you go along. We've created this guide with newcomers in mind. We'll pepper out a primer with recommendations for games, books, videos, and even entire factions that you might want to learn more about. To be honest, that is one of the few good parts about this entire article. It does give you his further reading, reading bit, which is nice. Warhammer 40k began as a pastache of science fiction fantasy tropes. For instance, looking back at its inception in the late 80s, you'll find elements from Frank Herbert's Dune with a god emperor and a hatred of AI and the spacefaring navigators. But even early on, you'll also find more literary callbacks, including nods to John Milton's Paradise Lost. Yes, this, this is actually correct. 40k, as the original creator of it literally stated, is basically just him reading everything that was popular at the time and going, mine, 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 etc. And then making it into its own franchise. Now, I've always defended that because here's the thing. You can be original without being 100% original. It's all about how you package it together. And 40k and Warhammer Fantasy has been pretty good at that, although it is becoming less so in recent years. And I certainly cannot defend their incredibly aggressive litigation strategies, considering virtually all of their shit is built on other people's stuff, like, for example, Elric. Its earliest official work, Warhammer 40k Rogue Trader, uh, began with a preamble, a kind of Star Wars-style opening crawl that lays out the most basic facts that a reader needs to know. It's been changed and altered over the years, but here are the origin of the world from 1987. There is only war. You get the drift. Later rewrites of this piece add in references to the top-selling Space Marines and their comrades, but the bleakness of the Gomp God Emperor's reign has never been in question. Before we delve into the finer details of the modern setting, it is clear that humanity should not be taught, thought of as the good guys in 40k. Incorrect. Humanity is the good guys in the 41st millennium because they're us. Everyone is the good guy in the 41st millennium from their own perspective. Humanity is fighting for survival against encroaching alien hordes that want to eat them, enslave them, corrupt them, or simply just out-radicate them for shits and giggles. Humanity is absolutely the heroes in their own stories, in the same way that the Eldar are going to be the heroes in their own stories. And from the perspective of a human being, I consider the continued survival of humanity as a overall good thing. From the very beginning of the franchise to the current day, the Imperium is one of the most villainous factions in the entire galaxy. What? Okay. Don't get me wrong. 
The Imperium does a lot of cruel shit to survive, but one of the most villainous factions in the entire galaxy? What about the Necrons and the Catans, who literally feed of fear and terror, and have already wiped the galaxy clean of life once? What about the Terranids, which are currently in the process of attempting to eat the entire galaxy? What about Chaos, whose only goal is to corrupt everything into hedonistic extremes? What about the Dark Eldar, who literally live of torturing people to death? Eat my ass about this. So, this also feeds into this piece here. One of 40k was originally conceived as a political satire and as an anti-fascist work of fiction. No, no it was not. This has been debunked again and again and again and again by the original authors, who have said that no, they didn't think of this as a political way, it was a grab bag of current pop fiction nonsense. They had no political overarching ideas here because, as it might shock you to learn, Polygon, there existed a before time. A glorious period which wasn't the current year, which where everything wasn't actually divided between the furthest possible right and the furthest possible left on the political compass. Where frankly, most people just didn't actually give a shit, and big dumb dudes in space marine armour and knights in space was just that. Big dumb dudes in knights armour with enormous guns fighting space aliens. Aye. And they go on, nevertheless, over the decades, the hobby has attracted no small number of right-wing fans who buy into either the in-universe propaganda of the Imperium or the marketing materials that describe the Space Marines and friends as noble protectors of humanity. Again, the Space Marines are the noble protectors of humanity. Who else are they the noble protectors of, exactly? The Eldar? The Nids? Chaos? Well, in part, I do suppose, with the Chaos Space Marines. But even this... It was conceived as a political satire and an anti-fascist work of fiction, and yet it has garnered a large right-wing following, has it? Polygon. Cease. Desist. Leave. Jump off a cliff. Commit harakiri. I don't even care, so long as you're not here anymore. It is idiocy. The Imperium was one as cruel or perhaps more cruel to its own citizen than to its outsiders it considers to be a threat to its way of life. I... I can't get past this point, can I? It considers to be a threat to its way of life. Oh yes, the, the Imperium merely considers the Dark Elder to be a, a, a bit of a threat. Merely considers chaos to be a bit of a danger. Merely considers the Terranids to perhaps be a mild impediment to the Imperium's continued oppression of its own people. No. The Imperium does not imp oppress humanity for shits and giggles. It doesn't do it because it thinks it's funny. It does it because it's necessary to fucking survive. Without using people as literal gristle for the machine to pump out endless arms and armor for the Imperial Guard, without the endless ties of tanks and chimeras, humanity would be eradicated like a thousand other species before it. And it will not be at the hands of other humans, it will be at the hands of dark gods and vile Xenos breeds. Mm. Again, this is the entire idea of having the 41st universe explained to you by an ideologically obsessed crazy person. The Imperium remains the franchise's normal main characters. They give the larger fiction in its point of view its most instances and absorbs much of the spotlight. This is even more extreme with the Space Marines, Games Workshop's top sellers. At least you've got that part correct. Authors will often hype them up and praise their virtues, outright ignoring, otherwise skipping over uncomfortable topics like their tendencies towards fascism, their origins as brainwashed child soldiers. Well, no. Their origins as brainwashed child soldiers is one of the most common parts in their storylines. Practically every Space Marine book begins with him as an initiate. It is seen as a tremendous honor. Every single Space Marine Codex, as far as I know, has talked about this. This is not a secret. This is not something skipped over. It is integral to their being, and it is part of painting the dark universe. Because 40K is intended to be grim dark. As for fascism... I did an entire video on how 40k is not a fascist setting and how the Imperium is not fascist, so I'm not going to repeat myself here beyond saying, no, it isn't, because it can't be. It logistically can't be, even if it would like to. So why are they so dang fun to read about? Take Frank Herbert's Dune. 
Gothic Christian imagery ramped up to 11, and giant war machines. Throw them all on a blender and you get 40k's Imperium of Man. Battle nuns drop cathedral tanks from orbit onto their enemies. No, they don't. Uh, the, the sisters of battle are not particularly fond of the orbital drop because they'd be, well, uh, that they, well, they just say that they wouldn't be doing quite well as the drop pods is a mm, not entirely unique space marine thing, but uh, it's uncomfortable for human beings. The Adeptus Mechanicus, a transhuman faction of religious cyborgs, chant religious rites to the machine spirit inside tanks. Aster Militarum, also known as the Imperial Guard, is a faction made up of trillions of normal dudes in flak armor whose commissars urge them to uh, forwards at gunpoint. This is also another example of the tourism, the Astra Militarum. You mean the Imperial Guard, newbie. Also occasionally referred to as the Astra Militarum by gays. It is a wild take on dystopian far future sci-fi removed from any of our current problems. Then why do you keep bringing up fascism? The Imperium sucks to live in, but it's fun to read about, and they have one redeeming quality, they aren't the other guys. Correct. Recommended media, Space Marines, Dark Tide, Vaults of Terror, series by Chris Raitt. That's not bad either. They quested novels, absolutely. Uh, we'll skip most of the recommendations thing. From 15 to 40k. The Imperium is based on a real-world history. Well, sort of, in a, in a sort of pseudo kind of way, yes, in that it takes inspiration and indeed rips off entire things, like the Macarian Crusade in Alexander, for example. But since it's so far in the future, there are some big gaps in the timeline. We know that the Emperor of Mankind and his close groups of allies are perpetuals, immortal humans that are reborn into new vessels after perishing. Well, and his closest group of allies? Who? Malkador? Malkador's not a perpetual. Nor are the Primarchs, either. The Perpetuals are a very specific thing, of which there are relatively few, and they were created by aliens, quite literally, or some sort of natural genetic mutation, which might have been the Emperor, as he is by far the most powerful Perpetual to have ever existed, casting his origin as one into a little bit of doubt, as only really the Perpetuals keep calling him that. And I suspect that might be because that is their only real frame of reference. Not to mention the Emperor's had a fair few origin stories over the years, even being the combined psychic spirits of thousands of the world's most powerful wizards, shamans, magic users, etc. I'm actually kind of surprised you didn't bring that up, because that would have fit right into your uh, usual worldview. They've been the background of all history, pulling strings and setting up pieces on the chessboard. Here are some humanities historical eras that end up setting the scene for 540k. Well, again, the the Emperor did have allies, but he wasn't, well, he was the one setting up things for humanity, and even then only after the golden age of technology, mind you. Uh, anyways, I shouldn't get too hooked up on these various things. The golden age of technology. Long after we were all gone, humanity hit its pinnacle and created a fully automated space utopia. Well, no, let's not get into the men of steel, stone, and iron. Well, no, stone, gold, and iron here, because that will be yet another massive deviation, but um, it might not have been quite so utopian as you imagine it. Then the AI controlled men of iron roams up to kill humanity. AI controlled men of iron. Again, this isn't actually necessarily th what happened, but uh, we would have to deviate quite far again. The AI control. So the Men of Iron may very well have been a specialized species of humanity that simply took over the robots. Alternatively, the robots might simply have just been war machines used by the then Federation to fight its wars. Alternatively, the Men of Iron might literally have been the automatons themselves. There are several sources suggesting, well, both of these things, actually, or all three of them more correctly. So, you can't say that quite as far, but... Yeah. And almost succeeded. This is why AI has been outlawed in 40k. Incorrect yet again, Polygon. AI is not outlawed because of the synthetic wars. They are outlawed because they are known as abominable intelligences. Because in a universe that has chaos in it, any true AI will take literal milliseconds to realize that the only way to protect itself from eventual destruction is to eradicate humanity so as to abuse chaos of one of its primary sources of power. 
The acronym now stands for Abominable Intelligence. In its place is a kind of horrific bioengineering, which uses human minds and bodies as the material for new robot-like entities like Servo Skull and Servitors. Well, they're just all called Servitors, but yes. The Dark Age tech that survived usually crops up again and again in the modern timeline to cause some kind of problem, but we otherwise know very little about this era. Well, the Dark Age tech is actually the fundament of all human technology. It doesn't just pop up every now and again. Every single solitary piece of the Imperium's technology is Dark Age technology, as it is all based on the original standard template contracts. The Mechanicus does not invent anything anymore. They simply rediscover and repurpose old technology. Age of Strife, The Long Night. With space travel shut off and the Men of Iron revolt leaving humanity in ruins, the survivors fell to civil war. <sighs> Again, yeah, not actually correct, no. It, it wasn't that humanity fell to civil war. The civil war was against the Men of Iron. After that, with space travel shut off, it was everyone for themselves. There was no large-scale organized civil war because there could be no large-scale organized warp travel. The Federation didn't fall to warfare with one another. It was shattered by the warp storms. But across multiple star systems, the Emperor of Mankind showed up on the main stage, created a faulty race of transhuman soldiers known as the Thunder... No, Jesus Christ, have you not even wikipedia this shit? The Emperor, the only... Okay, so, there are stories of humanity's previous existence, but as for the Emperor showing up on it, there are very, 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 very few mentions of that, and when it happens, it appears to be in mysterious circumstances. He, however, primarily remained almost exclusively on Terra. He did not put up on multiple star systems, and he did not create the Thunder Warriors in multiple star systems. The Thunder Warriors were created on Old Earth to begin the reconquest of humanity's empire. Yeah, yeah. And forcibly united humanity under his banner, starting with Terra, beginning of the era of the Great Crusade. Large parts of the race were stranded because their path and light tech went down with the Dark Age technology. No! Jesus, sweet baby. Because the warp made space travel impossible. And they were left to face constant assault and enslavement from alien Xenos. From alien Xenos. Xenos means alien, you titwink. The Great Crusade. The Emperor used his gang of genetic scientists to improve upon the Thunder Warriors, who were all dying horribly and intentionally. The first step was to create 20 perfect suns based on the Emperor's own DNA, but Chaos interfered by taking these primates and yeeting them to the far corners of the galaxy. At least they got that correct. The Imperium of Man began to scour the stars, searching for the Primarchs, even as it began bringing all human worlds back into the fold. Whether they want to join or not. During this time, two Primarchs were disappeared by the Imperium for unknown reasons and permanently scrubbed from the historical records. Well, two Primarchs were disappeared by the Imperium, the Primarchs, and the Emperor. So it wasn't just the Imperium who randomly killed them for no particular reason. Horus Heresy. The Horus Heresy is the civil war that followed the Great Crusade. Well, actually, it sort of ended it rather than followed it because it wasn't finished, but semantics on that point. For those living in the current timeline of 40k, the Heresy and even the Primarchs themselves are the stuff of myth and legend. Well, yes, except, you know, they're, they're back right now, and the demon Primarchs are still there, and Gilliman is wandering the stars, and the lion's back as well, but that is new fluff, so I'll excuse you for ignoring it, because frankly, I ignore it half the time. Only known through the practices of Imperial cults and scraps of history passed down through the generations. The story, set in the year 30k, has become so popular that it's now its own standalone war game accompanied by over 60 novels. Well, it's the other way around, really. It's its own incredibly popular novel series accompanied by its own standalone war game, but. semantics. This is a big Greek tragedy. Correct. It is literally a big Greek tragedy with elements of Egyptian lore as well. Horus betraying the god emperor Osiris, etc. <laughs> Where half of the Primarchs fall to chaos and rebel against their tyrannical father. Their tyrannical father? Their tyrannical father. Exactly how did the emperor tyrannize the Primarchs specifically? Because by and large that was an excuse, and by and large it was also made up as well. The emperor was in the process of handing over the reins of power within the Imperium to the Imperial Senate, to a democratic government. He was only being 
tyrannical because he was at goddamn war at the time. And even then, most of the planets who were introduced into the Imperium were given considerable leeway and even was outright supported by Terra and his initial colonies for a long time until the introduction of the Imperial Tithe, which was one of, although not the deciding factors, in creating the eventual civil war and many planets deciding to break away from the Imperium. But this, like, rebel against the tyrannical father. No, they, they fell to chaos. It had nothing to do with the fact that they were pissed off about his foreign or internal policies. In the end, Horus is obliterated, well, sort of, yes, and the Emperor is badly wounded, leading to the slow decay of the Imperium and the institutionalization of a mandatory religion, worshipping the God Emperor. Well, sort of. Again, that didn't leave, well, it did lead to it, but it wasn't the cause itself. It was the creation of the Imperial Cult, which was created during the heresy and then began to worship the Emperor as it began slowly corrupted by officials and bureaucrats. Ironic, considering the guy was a mega-atheist. Mm, sort of. He was weaponizing atheism. He himself knew the gods were real. In fact, he knew for absolute certain that the gods were real because he'd screwed them over. But he is too busy sitting on the Golden Throne, an ancient bit of tech that just barely manages to keep him alive to have any say about it. Uh, sort of. I'm gonna say sort of a lot I have a feeling of. What about 40,000? This is the era that most fans of 40k lapsed or otherwise think of when they think of the franchise. But for real world decades, the main plot of the universe sat stagnant. Thank the God Emperor for that. There were no further progression in the main setting, just new editions of the game that were pumped out on a roughly three-year cycle. Instead, the Black Library and publishing arms of the Games Workshop fleshed out what life was like in the Imperium of Man with works like Dan Abnett's Inquisition novels or Sandy Mitchell's Cypher's Kane novels. Those are good. Smaller scale stories unfolded in this setting, but there was no major shakeup until the recent years. Those were the good old days, where we could have any story we wanted in 40k without ruining the entire setting, but that was too much to ask for as it turns out. Era Indomitus, 42,000. In the Gathering Storm, Ass Backwards campaign ruining books, released in 2007, one lawyer's primarch, ultramarine and administrator extraordinaire Robert Gilliman returned. Unfortunately, around the same time, Chaos also split the galaxy in half, creating the Citraxix Maledictum, one of 40,000, and its extended materials have been focused on the response to Gilliman's return and the new nature of the post-split galaxy. A second loyalist primer, Lionel Johnson, has recently turned as well, setting up a post-heresy grudge match for the very future of the Imperium itself. Yes, it was awful. Terrible. 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 And it ruined KD as well, killing it off with barely even a send-off. The Imperium sucks, but it's so awful for a reason, and that reason is chaos. The ever-present enemy that feeds off humanity and would love nothing more than to keep them as slaves and soul cattle. Well, yes, they would like to pretty much just eradicate us entirely. Chaos is powered by the warp. No, chaos is the warp. A rolling mirror realm of emotion that exists parallel to real space. The warp is a corrupting force. No, chaos is a corrupting force. I know it's a little bit confusing, but chaos was always in the warp. But chaos is an entity of the warp, because the warp was always there, and chaos was always an entity of it, as the warp can be literally anything, to the point that the Eldar used it to build houses. While Imperial Psychers and Space Marine Librarians use the stuff to fight off the enemies of mankind, they're continually at risk of corruption, or of accidentally summoning a demon. You can't escape these malevolent energies, especially after the Citrix Maledictum was torn across the galaxy and the warp began continually spilling out of it. There are four main Chaos God, although recent campaign books like the Ark of Omen have focused on some many gods and the greater demons who want to earn a promotion. Each god corresponds to some kind of powerful emotion. Korn is a god of warfare and brutality, and also of just combat in general and bloodshed. See, that's the thing. Warfare and brutality. He's more the god of combat in general, really, as he's also the god of honorable warriors, too. His motto is blood for the blood of god, skull for the skull thrones. Zint is the god of change and is a patron to sorcerers and schemers across the galaxy. Nurgle is a god of life, disease and decay. A god of life. No, he, well, sort of. He is the only chaos god that creates life, but the only life he creates is flies. Literally. As his diseases, too, are more demonic in origin than bacteriological. 
Sinesh is a god of excess and pleasure. Born out of the heights of the Elda, not the Aldari, you goddamn recent year cuckwoff. Hedonism. Patrons of chaos can follow one god or all four if they feel like it, they just can't commit, which is chaos undivided. Or the minor gods as well. The natural minions of the Chaos Gods are demons, also known as the Neverborn. These are creatures from the warp that can only maintain materialize in real space when specific conditions, like copious amounts of human sacrifice, are met. Incorrect, yet again. Copious human amounts of human sacrifice is the the thing that causes the thing that allows the human the demons to materialize, as they can only de materialize in areas with an abundance of warp energy. The human sacrifice is there to thin the veil between real space and the warp. Cultists and double agents around the galaxy work on behalf of the Neverborn to make their manifestation possible. The gods and their followers continuously compete in the great game, and they're all as likely to backstab each other as actually fight a foe together. That is correct. But there are no soldiers of chaos as uncommitted as the chaos space marines who fell in the Horus heresy and are still, still created to this day. Horribly mutated, forced to eke out an existence in the eye of terror and whatever else they can be, frankly, and constantly struggling with what remains of their morality I don't know about that and humanity. The chaos space marines are a tragic mirror of their brothers. Tragic mirror, mm, sort of. I can accept that. The Night Lord Omnibus? Yes. And the Sabbath Wars? Yes. The First Heretic? Nah. It's Dembski Bowden. Avoid anything Bowden made unless it's part of the hottest heresy, in which case you kinda gotta get through it. Oh, do read the Night Lords by the way, because- oh, let me- let me- let me specify. Uh, avoid ever anything by Dembski Bowden that isn't about chaos specifically, because he does know how to write chaos, and he hates to write anything that isn't about chaos. Xenos, the aliens next door. Uh, this is where uh, we get the tiny bits, by the way, because all of the attention, I, I love how it's like, the Imperium, they're the bad guys, they're, we, you shouldn't give them so much attention. Yeah, the Imperium gets a load of backstory, Chaos gets a fair bit, and then everybody else, two paragraphs. <laughs> One paragraph for the Orcs. The original satire and humor of 40k still exists, and the Orcs are the best example of it. Yes, that I can agree with. And even the Tyranids, like two paragraphs, Necrons, one paragraph, Tau, two, Leagues of Wotan, a whopping three or four, wow. And that's it. I, I, I do love that. Welcome to 40k, here are all the factions, Imperium, 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 Chaos, Chaos, Imperium, Chaos, Chaos, Imperium, Imperium, Chaos, Chaos. Um, pfft, other aliens. <laughs> Well, thank you very much for the introduction, and seeing as you have not decided to lavish any sort of attention on them whatsoever, I too shall choose to not lavish any attention on them at all, at least as far as your explanation goes. Plus, I wish to come out of this with at least some semblance of sanity intact. Polygon's introduction to Warhammer 40k. It gets next to every single damn thing wrong beyond the most overarching and generalistic story elements. It gets virtually every single point of the actual minutiae of the setting wrong, 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 wrong. Doesn't expand upon anything that needs expanding. Fails to give you the real points of the backstory. Of course, forces in a little bit of their own idiotic political agendaism in there because 40k is not intended as a political satire. It is intended as a stupid grim dark universe where enormous dudes in power armor beat up alien bugs with flamethrowers. That is what it's intended to be, rather than a commentary on our current year bullshit. And of course, they take all of the other things that aren't the mainstream selling points and simply just toss them out of the window because frankly, after reading a couple of Wikipedia articles, the writer was just sick and tired of 40k and could hardly stand to be there for a second longer because his only interest in getting into this is because, oh hey, that 40k thing, that's a popular thing, we should get into that because us and every other mainstream media platform is currently on the verge of bankruptcy because nobody reads our garbage as this is the most up-to-date a screenshot of the article. 22 comments, with 7 comments initially. Nobody cares about Polygon. It is pure clickbait bullshit and it is pushed by the algorithm on the search engines, which is why the only reason why they are still alive is due to investment money and the fact that they get artificially benefited in searches. Beyond that, it is a garbage publication that God, Emperor willing, will die swiftly 
just like Vice is apparently about to do. Allah willing. Until next time, I have been Arch. Thank you very much for watching me torture myself by putting my testicles in a vice and slowly squeezing. Have a good day.